Uh, The church is small. Uh, God's people are scattered throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, They're in many places, but their numbers are not numerous. God's people have been eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus, the restoration of the world. But it's been decades since they'd first heard those promises. All around them is opposition. Uh, On the one hand, there's been the localised Roman persecution carried out by Nero, largely limited to Rome and its outlying suburbs. It started to spread. It's not systematic, it's not systemic, but it's started to spread. There's slightly more widespread persecution and it's getting worse because the new emperor, Domitian, demands to be worshipped as a god. In fact, you need to take public oaths of loyalty if you work in the Roman public service. And if you don't, the less said about your fate, the better. There's rumours of worse to come, that it will become more official and more powered by the might of Rome. And on the other hand, the Jews are now kicking you out of fellowship. The Jews have a special status in the Roman Empire of being a protected people. And up until this point, the Romans had just lumped Christians and Jews together. So Christians had been protected, but no longer. The Jews have made clear that they want nothing to do with the Christians. And so they've kicked them out of the synagogues and closed their meeting places to them. Christians have been moved to the margins of society more than they might have been in the past. All things seem grim. On a good day it might be grey. The usual day is grim. This is not what God's people had expected. What's happened to the promises of God? Is God still really in control? To all extents and purposes in daily human life, the emperors of Rome are triumphant. What they say is life and death. God's people are neglected and regarded as foolish and the future seems less rosy than it did before. That's the environment within which the book of Revelation was written. That's the environment within which Revelation brings an answer to God's people by taking them into the control room of the whole universe and telling them one very clear thing. God is in charge. His king rules. Don't be anxious. Does that sound familiar to you guys? It's a fairly pertinent word for today, isn't it? So with that in mind, let me pray, and we're going to look at it together. Dear Father, thanks for your word. Thanks that we can read it. Thank you for your son who died upon the cross and rose, having lived the life we couldn't live so that our sins could be paid for. Thank you that you've given us your spirit so that we can understand books like this and have them applied to our hearts. Please do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. So here, I just want to give us a summary of where we've been. This will bring us up to scratch. It's not a perfect picture, but if you've got those books, God's Big Picture, uh, you'll be able to find this in the back. Uh, We started over here uh, with the perfect plan in the Garden of Eden. Remember, God's promise was to have his kingdom, to have his people living in his place under his rule and blessing. And way back there at the start, when God made the world, Uh, In the Garden of Eden, he had Adam and Eve living in the Garden of Eden with a very clear command. You can eat from any tree in the garden, just not this tree. And they decided they could do a better job than God. And so you have the perished kingdom as things fall and they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They're removed from the presence of God. They're under the curse of death and the world is broken. And God commits himself to the universe here and promises that there will be a time when that will be returned, but even greater. Makes a promise to a man called, it's not a rhetorical question, Abraham, and he says that I'll give you a family and a land, and you'll live in that land under my rule and blessing, and through you I'll roll back the curse. We've been looking at that in Genesis, and we're going to continue that later on this year. Uh, They then come into the partial kingdom as God saves them out of Egypt, 
and they come into the geography of Israel and it's a taste, if you like, of what life can be. And they're in a place, a, a little patch of dirt, kind of like Newcastle to Wollongong, out to the Blue Mountains. And they've got a symbol of God's presence with them. That's the symbol of the temple. They have his law so they know how to represent him to the world. And under David and Solomon, there's a repeated emphasis on rest. It sounds like things are going well and that this might be what God had promised. But then that all falls apart and goes downhill as the people give in to their sin and divide. And God sends a series of prophets to call them back to their job before him and they paint a picture of the future where God himself will come and make everything new. When Matthew opens his biography about Jesus, he talks about the final descendant of Abraham and King David. That's Jesus Christ and Jesus is God come to dwell amongst his people so that he could live the life they couldn't live to die the death they deserve. So as Neil helped you understand, uh, Jesus is God's people, Jesus is God's place, Jesus is God's rule and blessing. And if you're connected to him by taking him at his word, by trusting in him, then you are part of God's people with a glorious future. Uh, We learned last week that we live now in the present kingdom, the uh, the, the proclaimed kingdom, the now but not yet. And now we have all the fullness of that, but we not yet experience it. And so we've got a job to do and... God's given us his Holy Spirit so we can do that job. Our job is to proclaim this to the world so that the whole world will know that God does exactly as he says. And we look forward to a time when that will be enjoyed in all its fullness. And so today we're going to look up here at the end at the perfected kingdom. That's a map of where we've been and what we've been doing. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 1 because as we work our way way through Revelation, uh, we're going to get a picture of what's actually going on in the world here and now as God reminds his people that he's in control. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. I think that's on page 1089. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Uh, The author is a bloke called John. Uh, He's the bloke who most likely wrote the biography of Jesus called Gospel of John, 1, 2, 3, John. From what we know, he's in exile in chapter 1, verse 9, on a small island in the Mediterranean called Patmos. The Romans didn't like what he was saying about Jesus, so they put him there. The problem with John is he just never shuts up. He just keeps writing, just keeps talking. A revelation is written in chapter 1, verse 4, to the seven churches in Asia. Now, the church is not that small, just seven meeting places. Uh, But the number is significant because... We've got to get used to numbers and pictures as we deal with this book. And the number seven throughout the Bible means what? Complete, doesn't it? So this is God's word to his complete community, wherever they may be. Uh, It's written by a real man to real people in a real time. And the time is about the 90s AD. Domitian rules the Roman Empire. The Christians are spread out. And under Domitian the persecution becomes systematic and part of the Roman system. It starts to get organised. This letter is written as an apocalypse. Now, the word apocalypse sounds scary. It really just means revelation. Hidden stuff made clear. It's also described as a prophecy in the original language. 
And if you remember what we learned about the prophets, they are not original. They just speak God's word to God's people. Not just. They speak God's word to God's people. As an apocalypse and as a prophecy, it uses picture language. Images, numbers, colours to give us a big, broad, brushstroke picture of the world at the moment. But its topic is very clear. What name is repeated time and time again in those first six verses? Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show. The testimony of Jesus Christ. Down there, verse 5, things come from Jesus Christ. In verse 5, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood, that's Jesus Christ. In essence, this is the revelation from God in his words about Jesus and what he is doing now. And do you notice how he's described there, down there in verses 5 and 6? He loves us. He's already set us free from our sins. He's made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. What does he deserve? Everything. Right from the get-go, we're reassured about the world we live in. This letter is a revelation from God about Jesus Christ and what's going on in the world today. Now, it's caused a lot of controversy, this letter, hasn't it? Caused a lot of debate and a lot of argument. And sometimes it's caused division. But it's about Jesus first and foremost. You can't miss that from the first six verses, can you? And it uses a particular type of language. It's not language we're familiar with, is it? But it's language that must have been understood by the first recipients because we're not given a guidebook to Revelation as the next book in the Bible, are we? It stands on its own two feet. It can be understood if we understand the literature and the language that it uses. It's not just limited to when it was written, the times of John and what's going on under Rome, though we've got to know that history. It doesn't aim to give us a timeline of all of history so that we can map events and map particular human kingdoms against which animal, which number and which colour. It's not just about the future so that we might have a timeline so we can work out the week, day, hour and moment when Jesus will come back. It's a bit of all of that stuff, but it's not just one of them. At the start, it's a letter to the seven churches. If you look at chapters 2 and 3, just skim through them, you'll see that there are individual letters written to individual churches so that they are aware of who they are and what's going on at that time. And then at the start of chapter 4, I'm at point 3 on the outline, John is taken on a journey. Revelation 4 verse 1. After this I looked up and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I'll show you what must take place After this, immediately I was in the spirit and there was a throne in heaven and someone was seated on it. The one seated there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian stone, a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surrounded the throne. John is taken up into heaven. John is taken into the cockpit of the universe, the control room. And he is shown the stuff that will take place after this. That's an important little phrase. It's talking about from when John saw this through to when Jesus returns. So what we're going to get is the now but not yet. An understanding of how to deal with these days. And when he goes into the throne room of God, there is someone seated there. One who is almost beyond description. The image is unmistakable because if you know your prophets and you remember places like Isaiah and Ezekiel, you'll recognise who this one is, won't you? You'll know that the one seated on the throne is God. 
Around him are images and pictures of all the authorities of the world and God's people. And everything around him bows down to God. God is in control. Over in the West, I made a joke about the fact that we can't even control the production of toilet paper at the moment, can we? And then I was foolish enough to say that there's one seated on the throne who's in control. I won't need as long to get your attention back, will I? But there at the centre of the universe, on the seat of all authority, is God himself. And listen to what is sung to him in verse 11 of chapter 4. Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honour and power because you have created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Did, did you catch what was said there? God just didn't make the world and then wander off and was absent-minded. Did you notice what it said there? They exist now, present tense. The world does not fall apart because God sustains it with his very own hands. He's in complete control. And as God sits there, he holds something in his right hand, verse 1 of chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll was writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look in it. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. The scroll in God's right hand is a symbol, a picture of God's plans for the now but not yet. That's why it's got seven seals. It's the complete plan. It's written on both sides. Who can open that scroll? Not, not you or me. And that's why John weeps at that point, because he knows that no one is worthy to come before God and have the revelation open before them in their own state. And then something takes place that's remarkable. Verse 5, Then one of the elders said to me, Don't weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He went and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. What an image. So the last thing John expected to see in heaven was a lamb covered in blood. But did you see how the lambs described there in verse 5? A lion from the tribe of Judah the tribe from which all the kings of God's people would come, we're told in Genesis, the root of David. So this one is the one greater than David because out of him comes the greatest king of God's people on earth. This is a king who's conquered everything. If you remember back to chapter 1, he's dealt with our sins and conquered death. He can open the scroll. Notice how many horns he has, seven, the complete power. How many eyes? Seven eyes, seven spirits of God. Uh, this lamb knows everything because he and the Holy Spirit are together. Who's that lamb? Well, it's got to be Jesus, doesn't it? Look there in verse 9 of chapter, chapter 5, and they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, because you were slaughtered. You were slaughtered. Purchase people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they'll reign on the earth. It's Jesus who died for the sins of God's people so that they could be gathered into the presence of God. He conquered the last known rival to God, sin and death, the devil. He set free the people of God and he's come to rule with God. So in verses 12 to 13, they sing the same words about the lamb as they sing about the one on the throne. Now imagine that you're a Christian in Asia under the rule of Domitian and you hear rumours and gossip and you hear what's happening down the road in the marketplace in this town and that town. 
of the persecution that is coming, that is gathering, that will be systemic and systematic, backed by the power of the greatest empire in the world. And you hear this? What do you hear? There is someone in control. There is someone in control. The one on the throne and the one who has conquered our last enemy. Now as the Lamb opens that scroll, I'm at point four on the outline and we'll go through the Revelation 6 through to 17 really quickly. As the Lamb opens that scroll, the events of the now but not yet, from when Jesus went up to when he returns, those events are portrayed. And they're portrayed in a particular way. Past, present and future in one go. And so you have three lots of seven. Remember seven's complete? The complete plans of God. And there's imagery there. There's seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls. It's the now but not yet days seen from three different angles so that you understand that amidst the chaos, the one on the throne and the lamb know and have oversight over everything that's happening. In fact, in the middle of it, in chapter 7, John is taken in and shown the citizens. And if you look at Revelation 7 verse 9, after this I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. You're already there. It is certain. God's people are secure. The world seems chaotic. We cannot organise even toilet paper, but our citizenship in heaven is guaranteed. And how is it guaranteed? Well, if you look down at verse 14, then he told me these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. The one seated on the throne will shelter them. They will no longer hunger, they will no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat. For the lamb who is at the centre of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of waters of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And Domitian thinks he can kill you? You have the one who conquered death covering over you so that you will be shepherded through a world that is chaotic and self-indulgent and self-important and you will get there in the end. What more do you need? There is someone at the cockpit of the universe who is in control. Now, does that mean that it's all going to be smooth sailing? That's why we've got this letter, isn't it? And so when you go through to a place like Revelation 12, you have a birth scene where there is a dragon who wants to eat a baby. Now, you can't miss the imagery, can you? So that even at the birth of this child who we know in the book of Revelation and from the Gospels will rule the universe, who is the lamb who was slaughtered, even at the birth of the child, there is a dragon in the room, not an elephant, a dragon. That's a new nativity scene, isn't it? We don't see many of those on people's front lawns. But that's a reality when you read the birth narratives, isn't it? What's Herod as he slaughters all the boys aged under two? Why do they have to flee to Egypt? Even at the birth, there's a dragon. What happens to that dragon? He's quenched, isn't he? He's got his head chopped off. At the cross, he's beheaded. He wanted to snatch the baby at birth. He wanted to tempt him in the desert in Matthew 4. Perhaps he was there at the Garden of Gethsemane saying there's another way. At the cross he thought he was triumphant and at the tomb he was defeated. But he's thrashing around, which is what happens in Revelation 17 to 20. We get a description of the thrashing around of this alternative rule as we wait in the now but not yet. 
Uh, Revelation 17, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me. Now, at that point, you need to be reassured because you've got a messenger from God who is part of the complete message, who's holding part of the complete plan, telling you something that is really horrific. So you need to be reassured. God's in control. Come, I'll show you the judgment of the notorious prostitute who is seated on many waters. The kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with her, and those who live on the earth became drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. And then he carried me away in the spirit to a wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. She had a golden cup in her hand, filled with everything detestable and with the impurities of a prostitution. On a forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the detestable things of the earth. And then I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. And then I saw, when I saw her, I was greatly astonished. That's a pretty horrific vision, isn't it? Babylon, a pretender. Do you notice the pretending there? Not a throne, but a scarlet beast. Not all those beautiful gemstones, but the second-rate ones. Not the glorious glory that you can't look at, but her own robe of purple and scarlet. Not a scroll with seven seals, but a golden cup. Not the plans of the universe, but impurity. Who is she? She's Babylon. Now, it's not Babylon in history. They only lasted a 100 years. They're nothing. It's the alternative rule to God. That's what Babylon is. That's the image here. It's everything that us humans set up in our natural state when we think we can be God instead of God. Why Babylon? Well, just go back to the book of Genesis and remember the Tower of Babel. Well, what were humans trying to do there? Build a tower to make a name for themselves, an alternate kingdom to God? And do you notice that all the rulers, the ones who rule nations and the ones who just rule their own households, have drunk with her, have chosen an alternative rule to God and her fate is quite plain. By the end of Revelation 20, Babylon, the alternative rule to God, the human society separate from God, all the powers, the beasts, all the ideas, the false prophets, all the originator, the devil, is cast down and destroyed and put into hell. By who? By God through Jesus. The old has gone. That grubby, rebellious, damaged, broken, damaging world that emerged out of the Garden of Eden is now destroyed. The old has gone and the new has come. I'm at point six on the outline. Then we see the alternative in Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. Don't worry, surfers, it's just an image of chaos. There's no chaos in heaven. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity. He will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. And then the one seated on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. He also said, right, because these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, it is done. That sin-damaged, broken world is replaced with a brand new heavens and earth. Sin had broken the first physical world and God replaces it with a new physical world. He brings in a new Jerusalem, the city where he'll dwell with his people, an image of close community. God dwells face to face with his people from every tribe, language, tongue and place. It figuratively covers the whole known world where God lives with his people. And in this new city, 
Revelation 21 verse 22, you don't need a temple. I did not see a temple in it because the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. You don't need an image to live with God. You live with God. You dwell in his presence. You see him face to face. And in that new heavens and new earth, there is no sin. There is no death. There is no anguish or grief or crying. It has been done away with. There are things that are reminiscent of the Garden of Eden, but it's better. Of verse 1 of chapter 22, there's not four rivers, but one river, the water of life flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Uh, there there's the tree of life on each side of the river. Remember, we weren't able to access that after Genesis 3. Now we can eat of it in any season, always producing its fruit. The nations are healed. They're not cursed. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. They'll see his face. Do you know, that there won't even need to be a sun and a moon. It's better than the Garden of Eden because God himself is the light and he'll dwell in the middle of it. God will do as he promised. He will reestablish his kingdom as he intended. People from every tribe, nation, language and place will be there. They will dwell in front of God and the rule and the blessing will be the presence of the one on the throne and the lamb next to him. There's our summary of where we've ended up in the perfected kingdom. You know, they used to have those T-shirts, uh, cups and posters that had um, stay calm and, do you remember them? They were a celebration of the British Empire, really. Let me tell you about that. The empire upon which the sun never set. Because England was in charge, don't worry, don't stress. Everything is under control. Unfortunately, the empire upon which the sun never set faded, didn't it? But there is still a reason to stay calm and not worry, isn't there? God remains in control. He and his king remain seated on the throne in heaven and they have a wonderful habit of always doing as they say. There is an immense encouragement for people like us at a time when our world is surrounded by anxiety and fear-mongering. Of all the people in this world, we are the ones who have no fear. There is one seated on the throne there is a slaughtered lamb in the heavens and our sin is paid for. Our judgment is paid for. There are days where I will read the news websites, listen to the news, read the papers, talk with my friends and I'll say, I'm not in control. You're not in control. Who's in control? There is one on the throne and there is a slaughtered lamb in heaven. The book of Revelation reminds us that God and Jesus are in control, that they are already seated above everything. There is hope there, isn't there? Immense hope and confidence. In a world where we are surrounded by evil, depravity, damage, trauma, lament, mourning, grief, loneliness, persecution, poverty and oppression, there is hope. There is one already seated on the throne. God's promises have not failed yet and they will not fail. So let me tell you two things that we can do. Let me tell you that we can explain the world to those around us, can't we? We've just gone into the cockpit of heaven and seen the now but not yet days. In our town at the moment, in our nation, there are many who are anxious, aren't there? There are many who are fearful because the world seems so fearsome. We have an explanation and we need to share it. Which leads to the second point, 
We also have an an answer to anxiety and fear, don't we? It is no secret that our society is getting more anxious and more fearful. And we actually have a way to navigate that within our community. Let me tell you, this week you will have a conversation about anxiety. You will have a conversation about fear. You will have a conversation about chaos. Let me remind you of what we're told in Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When you have that conversation this week, let me give you a small challenge. Finish the conversation by inviting the person to pray with you. It's a very simple prayer. Dear Father, thank you that you are in control. Thank you that your son Jesus lived, died and rose so that my sins could be forgiven. Please calm my fear and help me to know you. Amen. Let me tell you that in 11 years of parish ministry in this neck of the woods, not one person has said no when I've offered to pray with them. It might be next to the bananas in Coles. It might be at the bakery. It might be at the ATM. It might be as you pick kids up from school or drop them off. But as you have that conversation about fear and anxiety and chaos, why don't you finish it with the invitation to pray? Finally, we finish this series. Let me make one more plea. Please use this pattern to read your Bibles. It's a scheme, a way of helping you understand how the whole Bible fits together as God's promise to bring about his kingdom. But please don't stop there. Don't be satisfied with the scheme, but understand the Bible and the scheme that holds it together as a way of knowing who? Of knowing God. Don't just know a scheme. Know the God behind the scheme. So please read your Bibles this week, knowing the kingdom of God, and please know the one who is the king. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. We've covered a whole book of the Bible in a number of minutes. But thank you for the key message that Jesus and you are in control and that we can have confidence in a world that is so chaotic. Father, in our town, in our families, in our workplaces, help us to share this confidence. And Father, bring many others to know you so that they can face the future with their sins forgiven as part of God's household. Amen.